talk about <laughs> two types of transport. Um, diffusion and osmosis. Diffusion technically can also be called simple diffusion. And it was the movement of substances from higher concentration to lower concentration. It required no energy, so we call that passive transport. Osmosis was specifically the diffusion of what? Water. Water, exactly. So osmosis was also passive transport, required no energy, moved things from higher to lower concentrations, but specifically water. Facilitated diffusion or facilitated transport <coughs> is just like diffusion. It's still higher to lower concentrations. The difference is facilitated diffusion is where the substance doesn't go through the phospholipid part of the membrane, but instead it goes through a protein, either a channel or a, a carrier protein. I'll show you the difference between a channel and a carrier in a second. But in general, people mess this up because people, um, for whatever reason, when they see a picture of this or they see the definition, they think because it says that it's facilitated or helped by a protein, they think it's active transport, that it requires energy. This still requires no energy. If you think of an open field um, and everybody can cross it and everybody goes from where there's more to where there's less, this would be like simple diffusion. If you think of a wall though, and there's sort of an open gate and everybody that happens to hit in the right spot gets to pass through that open gate, this would sort of be like the protein carrier. This would be like facilitated diffusion. It's still moving things from higher to lower concentrations, but instead of being able to pass directly through the phospholipid bilayer, it requires a protein. It has to go through a protein channel or tunnel or a carrier, but it's a specific opening that allows things to go through. Again, it still doesn't require any energy. As long as the protein is present, anything that um, that particular substance, whatever that protein will allow to pass, will go right through. This... Um, Specifically, we'll, we'll speed up, like I said, passive transport. You could include in this aquaporins, for example, even though the movement of water is technically osmosis. Remember that water actually doesn't pass through the phospholipids. It passes through proteins called aquaporins. It still moves from high to low. This would also include certain channels that are called gated channels. I'll show you a picture of a gated channel in a second. But a gated channel is sort of a channel that looks like this. It's a protein in the membrane, and it's got like a little tip on it that's closed. This is the cell membrane here. And when it gets stimulated, it gets bumped. Basically, this little gate opens, and then whatever the molecules are, they can flow through. Still doesn't require any energy necessarily to open that gate. It could be anything that could stimulate the opening of that gate that wouldn't necessarily be something that required energy. But when that gate opens, it sort of allows everything can just start flowing through. Um, and then carrier proteins, like I said, they look a little different because they change their shape when uh, when they're letting something through. So I'll show you, um, this is the difference between a carrier protein and a channel protein. So a channel protein sort of looks more like a tunnel, still going higher to lower, no energy is required. This is what a carrier protein looks like. Carrier proteins tend to sort of mold around the molecule and change their shape to let the molecule through. But again, as long as you don't see anything about energy in the picture, and the way they would represent energy in a picture is that they would probably show like either the word energy or you'd see ATP with a little arrow. That's how they would tell you energy was needed. If you see energy is needed, it's not facilitated diffusion. If you don't see anything about energy, and notice in the picture that there's more on this side, so it's going from where there's more to where there's less, that's going to represent facilitated diffusion. Now, what is it when it does require energy? This, oh, this is a gated channel. So this is when the gate is closed, and then if the gate opens up, the molecules can go through. Again, what stimulates the gate to open may vary. We're going to talk a little bit about nerve impulses tomorrow, which is an example of gated channels. Um, this is a little uh, animation showing facilitated diffusion. These things can't pass through the phospholipids, but this blob here is supposed to represent the protein and they can pass through there. Again, they're going from higher to lower concentration. All right, so what do we call it if it does require energy? That's called active transport. Active transport specifically is the movement of substances the opposite way than the way they would naturally flow. Think of if you um, had a hole, in, you had a boat and there was a hole in the bottom of the boat. Water would naturally flow into 
to your boat. It would not take any energy. That boat would naturally fill up with water. But if you wanted to get water out of your boat, you would have to get a bucket and actively get rid of it. Anytime the cell wants to get send something against the concentration gradient, meaning sending it from where there's less to where there's already more, it's going to require energy. That's the definition of active transport. Again, it's sort of like you trying to paddle upstream in a boat or if you have water leaking in and you're trying to get rid of it. So energy is always going to be required for active transport. A lot of times they will help you out in a picture because they will literally show ATP in the picture, which is like your key that it needs, the process needs energy that automatically means it must be active transport. A lot of times you'll, you'll find in a cell, <coughs> remember that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. They're the ones that are generating the ATP. So a lot of times when act, we're in areas where there's going to be active transport, you'll find a lot of mitochondria near those specific proteins. And I'm going to show you the most common textbook example of active transport, um, which is called the sodium potassium pump. And that's the last thing we'll talk about today. And then I will leave you uh, some time to work on the lab. So this is sort of an illustration. See how the molecule ATP comes in and, and the phosphate breaks off of ATP, by the way. That's how it provides energy. The phosphate breaks off and that's what allows this particular protein to allow something through. This is sort of an animation of what active transport would look like. Um, so the sodium potassium pump is the most common textbook example of active transport. Every cell in your body has this particular protein pump in action. Um, so there's a sort of a walkthrough of what happens and the stuff that you need to write, I believe, is coming from this stuff at the bottom. So the first thing that happens in the sodium potassium pump, if you notice, is three sodium ions bind to this protein. So this is the protein in the membrane. It's open to the inside. Three sodiums come in and they hook to this, um, this side of the membrane. Keep in mind that sodium is actually in higher concentration outside. In other words, sodium would not naturally flow in this direction. It would naturally flow in the other direction. Plus, sodium is an ion, so technically it can't get through the phospholipid part of the membrane anyway because ions can't pass that area. When three sodiums bind, the next step in the sodium potassium pump is that ATP comes in and it drops off a phosphate. That's like I said, when we talk about ATP coming up in, in a future chapter, we'll talk about the way that ATP actually provides energy for reactions is it gives away a phosphate going uh, from ATP to ADP, triphosphate to diphosphate. When, it, when that phosphate hooks to the protein, the phosphate, and they call it phosphorylation, it's just giving a phosphate, actually stimulates this protein to change shape. So let me show you on the next page here. Notice what happened. When the phosphate bound to this, it caused this protein to change shape. And in this shape, it's no longer attracted to sodium. The new shape that it has releases the sodium. So now three sodiums basically got transported from inside the cell to outside the cell. The new shape that the protein now has is attractive to potassium. So the next thing that's going to happen is that two potassiums are going to bind to this protein while it's in this shape. And when the two potassiums bind, that actually triggers this phosphate to leave. So we started with three sodiums coming in to the membrane, to this protein. Phosphate triggered the protein to change shape, and those three sodiums got off on the other side. It kind of reminds me of a train or a carnival ride or something. You know, everybody gets on the ride. The phosphate's sort of like the worker. He causes this ride now to go to this way. Now these get off. These get on, which causes this to break off. And when this breaks off, the protein is now going to go back to its original shape. And now the two potassiums are going to be released inside. Now, bottom line, I know this is in six drawings. You could simplify this, really, to, to one thing. You've got a protein. The bottom line is this. Three sodiums are going to get transported out. Two potassiums are going to get transported in. And the stimulus for the change in shape of the protein is one ATP. It requires one ATP. 
The ATP is sort of the key to flipping it, to causing the shape change to take the three sodiums out, the two potassiums in. Most questions you might be asked about this would be verbal questions about the direction, which direction different things are going. So if you can remember that summary, even if you can't remember those six pictures, um, three sodiums get moved out, two potassiums get moved in, and one ATP is what's used to change the shape for all of the transporting that's going to happen. Um, this is a summary. Actually, I'll come back and I'll leave it at the summary. Let me show you this little animation first. So this little animation kind of shows you what's happening. So there's our three sodiums. They're technically not lined up waiting for it. They would be moving around randomly. There's the phosphate from ATP. That causes it to change shape, which causes the sodiums to be released. Now two potassiums come in. Again, they're not waiting like if they're waiting for a ride or something. Um, so that causes the phosphate to leave, and it goes back to its original shape. So that sort of summarizes everything that happens. I'll let it play one more time. So three sodiums come in. Again, it would be more random. They wouldn't be lined up. ATP, a phosphate breaks off of ATP, which causes this protein to flip its shape. That releases the sodiums. The two potassiums now come in because this new shape is attractive to potassium. The binding of the potassiums causes the phosphate to break off and it goes back to its original shape. So overall, it carried three sodiums out, two potassiums in, and it took one phosphate to do that. All right, and this last slide here, this is sort of a summary picture. I made a Quizlet of this picture with labels to kind of help you see the difference between the different things. So simple diffusion, higher to lower concentration, just through the phospholipid bilayer. Facilitated diffusion, still higher to lower concentration through either a channel, which is sort of like a tunnel, or a carrier protein, which sort of molds around the molecule. All three of these are passive transport. They don't require energy. They carry things in the direction they would normally flow just by random molecular movement. And then active transport carries things against their concentration gradient. Honestly, the key to look for, if you see ATP or the word energy, you automatically know it's active transport. Uh, but the other thing they would usually show, like for example, they're carrying in these, whatever, these are probably supposed to be potassium. This is this thing. Notice how there's two out here, but there's a whole bunch in here. So technically it's moving things against the concentration gradient. In theory, this is not the direction that this would naturally travel because it wouldn't go from where there's less to where there's more. So active transport carries things against the gradient, but in addition, it always requires energy. All right, so that's actually where we're going to stop today.